Okay, so let's get started. Hello and welcome to the third event in the Voices in Vegan Studies speaker series. I will be your host today. My name is Jonathan Dickstein and I am a professor with Ari Hunter Institute and the lead organizer for the Vegan Studies Initiative. Some of you might be new to Ari Hunta, so I would like to share a few words about what we do here. Ari Hunta Institute's mission is to build a world-class online institution for deeper learning of the Jain tradition, its principles, and how these principles apply to daily life for the benefit and well-being of individuals and society. Now, one well-known expression of Jain values is its millennia long practice of vegetarianism and increasingly so toward veganism. This is one reason why with encouragement from members of the Jain community, we developed the Vegan Studies Initiative at Arihanta. The Voices in Vegan Studies series is one part of our programming with the two other educational components being a master's degree concentration and multi-hour online courses in vegan studies. Much more can be found on our website and I'll put some links in the chat throughout the session today. The speaker series itself takes place on the first of every month through 2024, except in June and July when we host three talks. Today's event will be followed in two weeks on Monday, July 15th with a talk from professor and philosopher Cheryl Obate. So now for today's event how to talk about dairy with Ed Winters. Ed Winters, also well-known as Earthling Ed, is a vegan educator, public speaker, and content creator, widely known for his viral debates, speeches, and video essays. Ed has spoken at over one-third of UK universities and at every Ivy League college. He has given speeches at LinkedIn, American Express, Pinterest, Google New York, Google Ireland, Google Zurich. In the UK, Ed is a nonprofit vegan restaurant founder and founder of Surge Sanctuary, an animal sanctuary located in the rural Midlands of England. He is also the best selling author of two books This is Vegan Propaganda and How to Argue with a Meat Eater. Throughout his body of work, Ed is dedicated to reducing the suffering that animals endure at the hands of humans, from debates and speeches to restaurants and sanctuaries. Ed is striving to utilize all means possible to create a better world for animals. We are very happy to have him here today with us. I now turn it over to Ed Winters. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for that lovely introduction. And thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. It's a really interesting conversation that I think we can have today around dairy around veganism around i suppose spirituality and and also approaching this from a from a non-spiritual perspective as well because i think what's really interesting about veganism is how i think it aligns with the principles that people have in society generally and that may sound i suppose contradictory in a way because surely if what i was saying was true then this conversation would almost be irrelevant because people would be vegan but I think that even though the principles and values of, of so many people in the world, I would like to think align with the core values of veganism, part of the problem is we never really think about our food choices and our relationship with animals in a meaningful and in, impactful way. And more than that, we're also, I suppose, manipulated and lied to and tricked by these very powerful, very profitable, uh, very politically influential industries that hold a lot of sway over us through advertising and marketing and legislation and all of these things that have really for decades now, you know, especially throughout sort of the mid to late 20th century and where we are now, dictated the conversation in such a way that the values that we have towards animals and the principles we have as compassionate and caring people sometimes don't then filter through into our food choices in the ways that I strongly believe that they should. Now, I hope to be able to cover some of these issues today, talk about vegetarianism, talk about the complexities around vegetarianism, and also the complexities around talking about vegetarianism, all with, I suppose, um, an aim of 
discovering a little bit more about this issue together and ultimately facilitating what could hopefully be a good question and answer session towards the end. So um, as it's already been stated, if you think of any questions or anything comes to mind, then please hold on to those questions, type them in the, in the Q&A box. And what I always say is, it's a really great opportunity to challenge me as well. Maybe you are a vegetarian, someone who doesn't feel the need to shift towards veganism, maybe something I say spurs a thought that you think is worth challenging. I would encourage you to, to please do that because there's no such thing as a bad question. And the, the questions that we ask can also be an engaging way of, of sort of prolonging and enlarging this conversation in a way that makes it even more impactful, hopefully. So I look forward to those questions towards the end. Now, I think the first place to start would be to focus a little bit on what my views towards these issues were not so long ago. Now, for me, I was raised in a family where the consumption of animals was completely normal and the consumption of dairy and eggs was far from ever being a concern, especially a moral concern, an ethical concern. I was raised in an environment where the consumption of these, animal, of these animals and these animal products was never viewed as being anything other than perfectly moral and justifiable. And we used to think that vegetarians were, were strange people. Um, I hope my family don't still think that, but um, I'm not so sure <laughs> they probably do. They probably think it more so since I, I became so passionate in my veganism. Anyway, for me, when I first went vegetarian, that idea was spurred on by the realization that I was uncomfortable with animals being slaughtered. I came across this story 10 years ago now, just over 10 years ago, actually. It was May 2014. And this story was in the BBC, so it was in the news, and it was an article I was reading online. And it was talking about this truck that had crashed. And it crashed on the way to a slaughterhouse because the truck was carrying about six and a half thousand chickens. And I was reading this article, reading about these chickens who had died, who had broken bones, who the ones who were alive, they were suffering, they were mutilated, some were crushed and had been killed by being crushed and some were, were crushed, crushed and alive. And I was reading this article and I, I was a meat eater at that point and something felt really wrong. And for the first time in my life, I did something that I'd never done before. I empathized with an animal, or more specifically, with a chicken. Because for me, I wasn't raised with animals in my home, so I never really thought too much about animals. I'd see pigeons on the streets, I'd maybe watch nature documentaries, but for me, animals were kind of this abstract concept. I wasn't raised with cats or dogs or, or any pets, and so I just had this idea that animals existed around us, but I never really thought too much about it. And so for me, having this moment where I was empathizing with animals, but beyond that, I was empathizing with the animals that I consumed. This was this big revelation to me because it unlocked something within me that I'd never really considered before, which was the values I had towards animals. Because even though I'd never really connected with animals, I'd never really spent any considerable time in the company of animals, even though that was true up until that point, I still realized that I had strong values towards them, that I was against suffering and cruelty being inflicted upon them. But in that moment, when I was realizing what these values that I had were, I also realized that I was in violation of my values, because in my fridge were the remains of a KFC, fried chicken. In fact, at that time in my life, fried chicken was my favorite food. So I'd been eating fried chicken very recently, was going to eat fried chicken later in the day to finish off the the leftovers I had. And yet here I am sat at my computer reading this article, which is making me empathize with chickens and making me realize that I'm against suffering and harm being inflicted upon them. And I realized I was a, a hypocrite because the chickens are in that, in that truck and were in that crash because they were supposed to be going to a slaughterhouse to be killed for, for me, for people like me, for people who enjoyed eating their flesh and their bodies. And I realized something else, which really became, I suppose, the, the catalyst, the start of me thinking about animals more and more deeply as time went on. I realized that the individual experiences of animals matter. Their lives 
matter. And as a consequence, the forceful and, and, and unnecessary taking of their life, i.e. what happens in the slaughterhouse, must be wrong, has to be wrong. Because it is, it is robbing someone of their life. It is forcing someone into a situation of fear and anxiety and anguish and pain and terror. And it's all needless. It's not in the animal's best interest. It's against their interest. And these thoughts at that time really started to make me reevaluate who I thought I was, the, the person I, I thought I was. How do we speak of things like compassion and ethics and morality and kindness while at the same time denying these things to animals or not factoring them in to these conversations? I had always considered myself to be a good person. And it's not that I, I was a bad person necessarily, but I realized that there was something bad that I was doing that if I continued to do consciously with the awareness that I was making, would surely start to contradict the perception that I was hopefully trying to craft of myself as being someone who did care about the experiences of, of others, who was against suffering and harm and immorality in the world. All of this led me to becoming vegetarian. And it's funny because as a vegetarian, I was staunchly against veganism. All of these things I just discussed were these realizations I was having and yet even with those realizations that I was beginning to explore more and more deeply, my vegetarianism was not enough for me to start to think about veganism. And I thought that the idea of being a vegan was extreme and dogmatic and unnecessary. And I thought vegans were uh, people who lacked fun, who, who had no sense of humor, who were far too pretentious and self-involved and, and just wanted the world to think they were special because they were doing something completely out of the ordinary that was unnecessary and extreme. And so even as a vegetarian who was recognizing the immorality of what we do to animals, I had this huge barrier in front of me around veganism. And the thing I always used to say to myself is, but animals aren't killed for dairy and eggs. Animals have to be alive to produce these products. And so what's the moral violation? What's the harm? What's the immorality here that I should be concerned about? Because slaughterhouses are one thing, but taking secretions that animals produce naturally and are biologically meant to produce, how could that possibly be unethical therefore? And about eight months into my vegetarianism, I began to realize something else. Now, like I said before, I, I wasn't raised with any pets, but at around the time that I was a vegetarian, I did have my first pet, my first companion animal, who was a hamster called Rupert. Now, Rupert was uh, this hamster I bought from a, a pet store. He cost 10 pounds, I guess in dollars, that's probably like 14, 15 dollars, something like that. Basically, a very small amount of money for an entire life, a whole being whose life belongs to them, whose body is theirs, bought and owned by me for such a small amount of money. But through having Rupert, I began to learn so much about him as an individual, his personality, his likes and dislikes. For example, Rupert the hamster was unlike other hamsters because when I bought Rupert the hamster, I bought him a wheel because I know that hamsters run in wheels. They're called hamster wheels for a reason, right? Because hamsters go in them and they run for exercise. That's what hamsters do. So I bought Rupert a hamster wheel because I thought that's what a good owner of a hamster did. Now, Rupert was alive for over three years, which is good for a hamster. But in that time, I saw him use his wheel, I think three or four times. So basically, he just did not use it. His use of that wheel was just abysmal. So instead, what I did is I bought him a ball, a clear ball. And I thought, I'll put him in the ball, I'll put him on the floor, and he'll explore the apartment. And you know, I thought, well, maybe he doesn't want to run on his wheel because it's kind of boring, isn't it? You, know, you look at this piece of plastic spinning around. It's not very exciting. But a see-through transparent wheel on the floor of my apartment and all of a sudden this whole world opens up and you can explore every nook and cranny and see everything that's there for him to see. I thought this is going to get Rupert moving and running around. 
And yeah, every time I put him in his bowl, he would take the food that he stored in his cheeks because, you know, hamsters fill up their cheeks with food. He would take the food out. He would eat some food and then he would go to sleep in his bowl and he would just sleep. He was so lazy, so lazy. And the reason I tell you this story is uh, not to shame Rupert for not exercising enough or anything like that, but instead to demonstrate how Rupert was a very unique hamster who was different to other hamsters in the sense of he didn't do something that I just thought hamsters did, run around in his wheel or in his ball. He didn't do that. You know, I could have gone to the same pet store, spent £10 or $15 on a different hamster, brought that hamster home, called that hamster Rupert, and that Rupert the hamster might have loved running in his wheel, might have loved the types of food that, that Rupert that I had didn't enjoy. For example, Rupert the hamster that I had didn't like kale. If I gave him kale, he would just want to eat it. He didn't like it at all, but he loved broccoli. But then another hamster who I could have called Rupert might have loved kale, might have been not so fussed for broccoli. And this really got me thinking about the individuality of animals. I think when we think about animal suffering and what happens to animals in farms and in slaughterhouses and, and sadly in, and in all of the other places where we exploit and harm them, we sometimes think about this, this notion of animal suffering as being this kind of abstract concept. And I think that often what we don't do is think about it from the individual perspective. You know, every individual animal in a farm is suffering as an individual, is having that fear and anxiety and terror experienced by them as an individual. And they all have these personalities that define how they perceive a certain environment. Some may feel more anxiety, some may feel more fear, some may feel more confident and yet may feel in a different way to another, might have a stronger sense of smell, better sight, might experience pain in a different way. And thinking about animals as individuals helped me empathize with animals even more. Sometimes we see posters and it's maybe a poster for a charity and it's fundraising. It may be fundraising for food, uh, for an area of the world where people are, are in famine or are suffering from hunger. Maybe it's a poster that's about climate change and we see uh, a polar bear in a melted ice cap or a koala trapped in a wildfire in Australia. What happens is we, we look at the individual and that individual is shown to us to help us create this very strong emotional connection to the individual who is suffering in that moment. But the problem is the animals who we farm are so far away from us. They're out of sight and out of mind. And so it can be harder to empathize with them because we don't connect with them as individuals in a meaningful way. We don't look into their eyes. We don't see them as the sentient beings who they are. We think of them as these collective masses of beings, but not as individuals experiencing the world as individuals. And at the time when I was having this revelation, a further revelation where I was vegetarian and I didn't like the idea of being vegan, I watched this film, this documentary called Earthlings. It's a very strong documentary, very powerful, very emotive. It's sort of an hour and 40 minutes of really horrendous graphic footage. It's filmed undercover of farms and slaughterhouses, animal testing laboratories, circuses, leather farms, fur farms, just a whole array of, of, of truly awful places for animals. And in the film, they talk about dairy and eggs and they show the practices that happen to these animals. But beyond that, the narrator, Joaquin Phoenix, the actor, talks about this notion of uh, speciesism, the idea of discriminating against animals, and the idea of challenging a mindset that we have. And I realized at that time that meat was a symptom of a problem. The problem is our mindset towards animals. Meat is a symptom because it is a practice that takes place only because of the mindset we have towards these animals. In other words, if we didn't view cows and pigs and sheep and chickens and all of these animals as being so beneath us and so unworthy, we wouldn't be able to justify the farming of them. 
but it is because we view these animals as having such little worth and, and having such, such little about them that makes it even an issue to think about them. It is because of this that mutilating them and macerating them and, and, and cutting their throats and forcibly impregnating them and treating them as, as reproductive machines, it is because of the way that we view them that these things can even be classified as moral in our world. And I realized that I had to challenge the whole paradigm that existed in the world around how we perceive animals and challenge this ingrained norm which told us that these animals are not worth caring about meaningfully. We might say that we do, we might pay lip service to them, but we don't actually, we have laws that make harming them okay. And we have justifications to try and ethically rationalize causing harm to them. These things can only exist in a world where that world is so far detached from these animals as the beings who they are. This is the only way that we can make these things seem even remotely palatable. And then I was thinking about dairy and eggs. By consuming dairy and eggs, I'm I in violation yet again of these values that I say that I have and this awareness they have around elevating the status of these animals. And I thought about what we do to these animals to produce these products. And is it as simple as these foods being okay simply because the animals are alive when they produce them? And there's a, a rather terrifying truth around dairy and eggs, which is that the fact that they have to be alive means that often their suffering is prolonged longer than for those who we raise just for meat. Uh, a chicken who's raised for their flesh and only their flesh is killed at six weeks. Now it's an awful six weeks of life. They're selectively bred to reach slaughter weight in that time and so they grow so fast, their organs fail and they die from starvation because they're trapped on their backs because they're too heavy to be able to stand up. I mean, these animals suffer terribly in these farms, but they're alive for six weeks. Egg laying hens are alive for 72 weeks. And in that time, they suffer from broken bones because they've been selectively bred to produce 300 or so eggs a year. And these eggshells are formed of calcium. That calcium depletes their bones and leads to things like osteoporosis and, and broken bones. And so many of them are walking around with these injuries, these chronic injuries causing them pain all the time. There's no relief to this pain. There's no relief from this suffering. They're crammed in these barns feather to feather, wing to wing with hardly any space to move, just forced to lay eggs like some sort of production machine. And then after those 72 weeks, those who are still alive are still taken to a slaughterhouse to be killed for their flesh anyway. I think of beef cattle, cattle raised for their flesh and only their flesh. They live for 12, 18, maybe 24 months. They could be branded, they may be castrated, they may be tail docked, they may have awful things done to them, but many of these animals live in pastures and graze, and so maybe their quality of life isn't even as bad as those that are raised for dairy, because in the dairy industry, these animals not only have those mutilations and practices performed onto them, but these mother cows are forcibly impregnated. They are impregnated by humans using their arms and their hands to touch them and exploit their genitalia to force a baby inside of them so that after the gestation period when these mother cows give birth the humans can then take their babies away from them almost immediately so that we can then take the milk from these mother cows something so awful the exploitation of a female reproductive system to to force a pregnancy to then take that baby away that they have this emotional connection to just so they will produce milk that we can then take and bottle to consume ourselves and then say that it's ethical because cows naturally produce milk and they have to be alive. So what's the problem? The problem is that whilst they are alive, they are exploited so severely, not just physically, but emotionally. The burden of this time and time again, every year this procedure is forced upon them. This process is forced upon them, each year wearing them down, forcing them to go deeper and deeper into this suffering. And then once they can no longer be exploited in this way, they are still taken to a slaughterhouse to be killed. Their suffering exists not for 12, 18 or 24 months, but for five, six, seven, eight years. So as a vegetarian, was I contradicting the 
values I said that I had. If I'm against slaughterhouses, but egg laying hens and dairy cows are still taken to slaughterhouses, is that not a violation of the principles that I say that I'm supposed to be living by? If I say I'm against animal cruelty and suffering, but I'm paying for these egg laying hens to be suffering in these ways, if I'm paying for hatcheries where the male chicks are macerated because they are useless because they don't lay eggs because they're male and so are killed as soon as they're born because that's the most profitable thing to happen to these animals. Am I violating these principles of being against animal suffering and cruelty? I must be, but there's no conceivable way that I can't be. What happens in dairy farms and in egg laying hen farms is among the most severe and pernicious forms of animal cruelty and suffering that exist in the entire farming industry, sometimes even worse perhaps than that which happens just in the meat industry. And that's why I think veganism is in alignment with the values and principles that we say that we have, because I'm sure every single one of us on this call is against all of the things that I've just described and is against principally animal suffering and cruelty. I'm confident of that because I'm sure most of you on this call are people interested in vegetarianism. Maybe you already are. Maybe you're a vegan. Maybe you're a practicing Jain who are interested in a, a spiritual teaching that centers compassion and benevolence and kindness to all beings at the center of that spiritual teaching. And then if you are, it makes complete sense that the, the views around what we do to animals are, of course, important to you. But where does that then leave us as people, as citizens of this world caring about these issues in a world where the suffering and brutality of inflicted on animals is ubiquitous and exists everywhere and good people like yourselves perhaps are paying for some of these things. Now this conversation, this title is kind of broadly entitled how to talk about dairy. And the reason for that is because conversations around dairy are tricky. And I think they're tricky for a number of reasons. Firstly, because of the myths that exist around it. You know, the myth that these animals are treated well, the myth that it's beneficial for these animals, the myth that it doesn't harm these animals, the myth that this isn't like the meat industry, that this is somehow separate to the meat industry, even though the dairy and egg industry is an extension of the meat industry, just with other practices within it that make it especially concerning as well. And so how to talk about dairy becomes hard because how do we broach that gap between people who care and people who are vegetarian, but who are not necessarily aware of how being a vegetarian causes harm to animals? And I think it's about speaking the truth about these issues in many ways. Because like I said right at the beginning, part of the problem that we have is that these industries are so powerful that they can weaponize legislation, they can weaponize narratives, they can use advertising and marketing to constantly reassure us that the consumption of these foods shouldn't be a concern to us. And the problem is the consumption of these foods transcends beyond just the suffering of animals, but indeed it becomes the suffering of us, the environmental harm from these industries. The dairy industry is one of the biggest polluters due to the methane that's produced by these grazing animals or these ruminant animals due to the huge amounts of manure that are produced, that are put in these manure lagoons, which are essentially huge ponds of feces that are festering and polluting the air and creating toxic and harmful greenhouse gases that contribute to the, the degradation of our planet. The industry is harmful to animals. It is harmful to our environment. It is harmful to us because Dairy is a product filled with things like saturated fat. Antibiotics are used in the dairy industry. And concerningly in the US, bird flu has been found in dairy herds. And so even now, the threat of an, the threat of an infectious disease like bird flu, which could cause the next pandemic, is becoming part of the dairy industry as well, because it is in the, it is in the cows in the dairy industry. And so all of a sudden, the problems associated with the dairy and the problems associated with eggs transcend beyond just what these things do to animals and become about what they do to us and to all life on this planet. Because these industries are impacting so many different parts of the issues that we currently face around social health and personal health because of chronic disease and environmental health and environmental justice and climate change and, of course, morals and ethics and, and animal ethics. 
somewhere within all of that are issues that resonate deeply with all of us. And so there becomes that necessity, I suppose, to challenge ourselves, to think about this in a way that holds ourselves accountable to these issues, to recognize that actually, whilst this conversation is troubling and is frightening because of what is happening, there is an empowering aspect to this. And I think how we can talk about dairy or how we can talk about animal farming and veganism in general that makes it something palatable and positive is to put that empowering spin on it. Because we think about so many problems that exist in the world and so much of the issue around these issues that exist is that we often feel very helpless to do anything about them. I think of war. I think about the instability that exists in the world, the violence that's been inflicted on humans by other humans, um, famine, starvation, all of these problems that exist, and even in many respects, aspects of climate change. And um, it feels really hard because as consumers and as individuals, we feel somewhat helpless to these problems or helpless in helping the people suffering in these terrible situations. But I think what's really powerful about food is not just its importance, not just that it causes some of the issues that we've been talking about, but because there is an empowering aspect in all of this, which is what we can do collectively. Because every time we buy cow's milk, every time we buy eggs from a hen, every time we buy meat, every time we buy an animal product, whether it be food or clothing or otherwise, we are facilitating and perpetuating these industries. We are asking for them to continue. However, if we remove our participation, we're signaling something different, that we want change, that we're going to demand change by adopting a different way of life and a different way of living that is demanding through the choices that we are making for a transition away from this violence, from this immorality, from this unsustainable industry that exists. And that's empowering because it means we're not reliant on legislators and we're not reliant on the CEOs of these big, huge conglomerates to have a change of heart overnight, which we know they're not going to. What we're doing is we're relying on us, decent, honest, compassionate, kind people, people who care, people who are willing to do something. We are reliant on one another because it is through the changes that we make as individuals and therefore collectively that real change can happen. The power does exist in our hands. To me, that is so empowering, so, so inspiring because it gives me confidence to know that I, and with the power of everyone around me, can be a part of this change. And all I have to do is challenge myself to live in accordance with the values that I have and hopefully compel others to challenge themselves in a similar way. And I think that's how we can talk about these issues, to highlight the, the problem, but to speak about the power of change, the, the positivity of change. Because what we have is the ability to make a rational, substantiated and morally driven decision that can have an impact that is not only beneficial to us, but transcends us. The issue with food is that it becomes so deeply ingrained within us through habit and through culture and through traditions and norms that it can become unconscious. We become automatons in a sense, just making these decisions because that's how we were raised and that's what's legal and normal around us. And so we just fulfill this ever perpetuating cycle of continuing things as they are. But what's special about humans in many ways is our ability to think beyond what is normal, to think beyond what is just available there in front of us and to think in complex ways that challenge norms and challenge ingrained behaviors. In fact, the world that we live in now, with even though it's completely flawed in so many ways, the world that we live in now has made great strides precisely because people challenged norms and challenged ingrained behaviors and challenged industries and perceptions that, have, that had existed for decades, hundreds of years. And we have a unique ability now to do something similar in regards to how we view and treat and respect animals. And I think that question of respect is also important. 
because our food choices are about respect because the food choices that we make can determine whether or not we respect the lives of animals and in doing so also respect the planet and all of those beings, human and non-human, that call this planet home, and whether we respect those around us who want to live on this habitable planet, or hopefully continues to be a habitable planet. And that's why that notion of respect is important, because it's not just about making a decision for ourselves, but making a decision for others. And that also fulfills this empowering conversation I'm talking, or, or fulfills part of this empowering conversation I'm talking about. Because the motivation that we have to become vegan, to live in a way that is the fullest alignment of the values that we actually have, is about viewing this issue beyond just ourselves and viewing how it encapsulates those that exist on this planet around us, human and non-human. And that's why respect becomes a huge part of this, respecting ourselves, but respecting others and empowering ourselves through this understanding that we may be gaining to challenge ourselves and live in accordance with the principles we have. Now we know that this, this is a, a broken food system that we have. And I think we are fully aware that something has to change. And I think for those of you who are religious and, and spiritual, I don't doubt that you're very troubled by so much of what is going on and the trajectory that we as a species are going down. And yet I think that if we are ever to reach a, a point in time where we can exist on a planet where the problems that exist now, we speak of in the past tense, we refer to as something that used to be and isn't currently. I think the only way that we will ever fully get to that is not just by treating ourselves, humans with compassion, but treating animals with compassion as well. Because I think whilst we deny animals compassion and kindness, truly compassion and kindness, I don't think we will ever reach a point in time where we will speak of our transgressions in the past tense or of our harms and, and our immorality in the past tense. And that is why I think veganism, whilst it may not be the solution to all of the world's problems, of course that's true, there is no solution to all the world's problems without it. Because how, that, how can there be a solution to all the world's problems while an industry and a mindset that exploits and pushes down intelligent, feeling, emotional sentient beings, how can we ever reach a point in time where we can pat ourselves on the back and say that we've reached some form of, of moral enlightenment while we still subjugate others, while we still look down on others? It is the elevation of others that can help us as a species elevate ourselves. It is the granting of kindness and compassion to beings so small that can make us realize the importance of granting compassion and kindness to beings much larger and indeed to all beings in general. I think how we view animals can be such a pillar, an important pillar in this progression to a world that is actually fundamentally one that we're proud to exist within, that we are grateful for existing in. And so I want to wrap this up very shortly, actually, because I think it's good to have some questions. Of course, it's important to have questions. But on the point of vegetarianism specifically, after I'd finished watching this documentary, Earthlings, and after I'd existed as a vegetarian for eight months, and after I'd had these interactions with Rupert the Hamster, and it begun to think more and more deeply about who he was as an individual and how he represented something bigger than just him, I was left with a very stark choice. I could bury my head in the sand, continue being a vegetarian, continue pretending that dairy and eggs weren't a problem, continue believing that I was living in a way that was the best realization of the values I had. Or I could make a change. And I could become a vegan. And I realized that there wasn't really a choice there in the end. Because to not make that change would be to go against these things that I was realizing and to go against who I wanted to be as a person. And so in the end, it became a no brainer in many ways. And that's what led me to becoming vegan. And I realize now that the notion of vegetarianism can be comfortable because it can reaffirm to us that because we're doing something, we don't need to do as much as we need to. And what I mean by that is because it exists in the middle ground, 
it could almost create a sense of complacency. And that was a place that I was in. I was complacent because I had convinced myself that I didn't need to take that next step. But as soon as that curtain was, was pulled in front of me and I could see beyond what it was that I'd previously thought, I realized that that wasn't something I could cling on to anymore. And that veganism was the option that I had to take for myself, for the planet, but undeniably and most importantly, for all of the animals who I want, who I wanted at that time to do something to, to help. Anyway, um, thank you very much for listening. Um, I do very much appreciate it. And I would like to make time now for questions. I think we've got maybe sort of 15, 16, 17 minutes for questions. Um, and I'd be very interested to know what those questions are and um, whether you agree with me or perhaps you don't, but I welcome any, any questions that you have. Thank you, Ed, for that fantastic talk and, and sharing um, of your own experience. And you can see some of the questions as well. I did oh, want to yeah. share because um, I know we don't have so much time, but it's a sentiment that I also shared from the beginning of this kind of vegetarian vegan journey, which is that you're often talking to people's existing values, right? You're not really trying to really change their mind. And just to give you some context in the perhaps the most well-known uh, slogan in Jainism, our line is ahimsa paramo dharma, right? Nonviolence is the highest duty, religion, responsibility, however you want to translate dharma. But you know, in, in the Jain tradition, it's it's just so palpable from the outset. And I, I think that's why um, a lot of people are drawn to the Jain tradition and its history. Um, and I just wanted to make that connection because everything you say about nonviolence and compassion just like checks all of these very, very well-known and pervasive boxes in the tradition. So, um, but not to take up too much time. So uh, one person asked, and I, this is an uh, interesting question. They asked that um, I am celiac and also try to follow a Jane diet mm -hmm. and now also vegan. I've always been skinny and going vegan has made my face dull. I haven't opened up to my family about being vegan yet since I already have a lot of food restrictions and they are very concerned about my health. How do I open up? It's scary. Yes. Absolutely. Great question. Um, my mother's celiac, actually. Um, she's not She's not uh, vegan, not yet. Fingers crossed one day. Um, she's celiac. And so I, I'm, I'm aware of, of the, um, the difficulties that, that, that can come with that. Um, so I think the important thing is if you're, if you're feeling skinny, make sure that you're prioritizing high calorie foods. Um, things like nut butters, for example, are a really easy way of, of getting more calories into your diet. Um, legumes, opt for legume pastas. I, I know there's like gluten-free pastas that exist, but opt for a, a legume pasta, I would recommend. So that could be like a red lentil pasta. Um, it, it just something that, that is probably more uh, nutritious, that has more protein in, and is probably, is probably better from, from a health pers perspective. So I would just make sure that you're, you're looking at the food you're consuming and, and, and maybe just make sure that you're getting enough calories a day. I know that it, there will be an added layer of difficulty because of your um, your celiac disease. But the good thing is, in a sense, that the foundations of a healthy plant-based diet are are um, sort of whole foods. Now, obviously, there'll be um, you know whole grains that you, you can't consume. But when you think about fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds and legumes and such, these are foods that you will be able to consume. And also importantly, these are the sort of the cornerstones, the pillars of like a really healthy plant-based diet. So make sure you're getting enough calories, make sure you hit, you're hitting your daily allowance. Um, it might be worth spending a week or two weeks tracking. Um, there are some sites uh, like Chronometer, I think uh, is one where you can log what you're eating and it'll tell you if you're hitting your targets. So just make sure you're hitting your calorie target every day. Um, and then beyond that, make sure that you're taking um, a B12 supplement. That will be important. Um, and also a vitamin D supplement. If, if um, I'm not sure exactly where you live, but if, if, you're, if you're in the UK or maybe you're in the US, but you live on the East Coast or the West Coast or something, if you know the Northwest, um, then just make sure that you're um, taking a vitamin D supplement as well. We should all do that, vegan or not. Um, so I would just recommend those things. But if, if you're worried about being skinny, um, calories, make sure you're counting your calories, at least until you're confident. And one of the best ways, calorically dense foods, um, nut butters, I would recommend, um, but peanut butter on toast, uh, well, peanut butter on gluten free toast would be a good option. Um, or peanut butter with, with any breakfast, breakfast stuff that you have. I think that's always helpful. 
That's really helpful. And, you know, I, I really have appreciated how you've approached the challenge, the kind of medical and health challenge is legitimate. It might be kind of the one, right? The one that is very nuanced from person to person. A lot of other things can be more black and white, but yeah. We can't purport to know how everyone is, their health issues, what they have access to. So I, I really have always appreciated your respect and compassion for individual struggles. So, thank you. Thank you. So next question is, there's a couple, like I'm going to try to group things together here um, that says, consuming dairy has been a part of our Jane culture for thousands of years. Why should we stop? We don't eat other things that cause harm like root vegetables, eggs, and meat. And veganism seems like a Western practice, not Jane. Much of our food requires dairy for cooking and dairy is healthy. And in India, there is no harm in dairy. I would like to hear your thoughts. So you can feel this as you like. I think there's the issue of a kind of, you know, cultural difference. There's also this yeah. notion of different forms of dairy. So yeah, really yeah. robust question. It's a great question and very important to ask. Um, but the first thing to establish and what I would say is I can't ever deny that um, it's an important part of culture or has been um, and has existed in, in culture. But the important thing to recognize is that um, just because something is cultural doesn't mean it is moral. And it also doesn't mean that it shouldn't change. Cultures have always evolved over time and Jainism is no exception. The way that we live, the way that we exist, how we uh, integrate the world around us, the technology that we use, all of these things evolves over time. And I think the important thing to recognize and I think the important thing to recognize about a religious and spiritual belief is, is it transcends something like the consumption of dairy. It is, it's a mindset. It's a philosophy. It's about compassion. It's about ahimsa. It's about treating life with, with respect and compassion. These are some of the fundamentals of, of such a belief. And so let's say maybe a thousand years ago, it might've been a different world to the world that we live in now. Undeniably it was. And so maybe the morality of certain actions and behaviors was different back then, but the world that we live in now is very different to the world a thousand years ago. And so what we have to ask now is, even if it may have been true at some point in history, is it still true that the consumption of these foods is in alignment with the, the wider spiritual beliefs that we have? And while I can understand that you might think that in India, the issues with dairy don't exist like they do in maybe the UK or the US especially, Sadly, that's not true. And if, for example, if you look at um, Animal Equality India, I think is one of the organizations, but there are a few animal rights organizations in India, you will see that they have lots of information and investigations looking at Indian dairy. And now in the talk, I described how dairy cows are impregnated to make them pregnant, so they produce milk. This is true in, in India. I spoke about how newborn calves are taken from their mothers so that we can take the milk that was naturally produced for them. The same is true in India. And I know that in India, there's a perception that the cows are treated um, as, 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 as very special and significant beings. And that's a very wonderful cultural belief. I think that's lovely. But in, in reality, these animals are still transported to areas where it becomes legal to slaughter them. They're still taken to different parts and they're, and they're still slaughtered. The thing we have to remember is that for dairy to be produced, you have to have animals constantly giving birth. Now, if you have uh, sort of a mother cow who's over her lifespan being impregnated every year and lives for all of the 20 years and is, is, is fertile from sort of 18 months onwards, she could have maybe... 15, 16 babies in her life, let's say, but then they're all having children and they're all having children. It's not possible for dairy cows to not be slaughtered once they no longer can produce milk or be profitable. There's just no space for them. There's no, there's no feasible way. And so even in a place like India, these animals are still exploited and ultimately are still taken to places to be, to be killed as well. So they may live a little longer, but the suffering is still the same and the exploitation, the practices are the same. And I would just ask, that in your own time, have a little look into the legal practices and have a look at some of the investigations that have taken place on Indian dairy farms, because while I wish it wasn't true, and believe me, I do, sadly, it is it, it is true that animals are harmed terribly in Indian dairy farms, just as they are in dairy farms all over the world. And it's, um, yeah, it's sad. So culture doesn't define something as being moral, but importantly, cultures should evolve and we should take our spiritual beliefs and we should try and update them to how things currently are. And if we find out, for example, that the way that we perceive something, i.e. the dairy industry, isn't what we, it turns out not to be what we think it is. And then that therefore means it's violating the beliefs that we have. 
it doesn't matter how long something's been a cultural norm for. What matters is whether or not now in the present moment, it is violating the beliefs and values that we have. And I believe most likely that when you look into what happens to Indian dairy cows, you um, will begin to see that actually, um, perhaps this is actually not in the in alignment with the values that you clearly and so rightfully hold dearly. Thank you for that comprehensive and sensitive response. And looking at some of the questions, I would like to kind of categorize a lot together and really speak to your ability to have constructive dialogue, at least years of following your work. That's what's impressed me the most, um, the way that you listen, you focus on listening and having respect for other people, right? I think this is lost. And so a lot of the questions are asking, how do I get through to a hard-headed meat eater or dairy consumer or my family? Um, how do I speak with them? Or how do I speak with people who are insisting that um, it's how we treat the animals, not that we treat the animals in this way. So I apologize for those asking questions that I'm really putting them all together here. But I think what a lot of people are speaking to are just some maybe fundamental tips of how do we even enter into these conversations, not with the goal of being right, but with the goal of actually reaching people? Oh, great question. Um, so I think the first thing, and maybe the easiest thing is live by example. You know, live, live, um, live as a vegan. You know, um, look after yourself and be a good role model for veganism just just by adopting those that way of life. So I think that's the first thing. I think sometimes just being around vegans can make people seem that can make people realize that it's not this extreme or crazy or in, uh, impossible thing. So live, lead by example. Number one. Number two, um, it's okay if there is someone in your life that you just can't get through to. I think we all have someone in our life. It could be a a spouse, it could be a father, a mother, a, even a child. There is probably someone in our life who is so staunchly stuck in their ways that it doesn't seem to matter what we say. Those people we might not necessarily get through to in the way that we want to, and that's okay. The important thing is not to be hard on ourselves. We can only do our best. And if someone doesn't want to listen to us, doesn't want to engage with us, is hostile, is rude, is argumentative, is something that's not helpful and Ultimately, we decide that a conversation with them isn't going to get somewhere or somewhere positive, let's say. It's absolutely okay to recognize that and not engage. So I think it's always important to recognize we don't have to engage with everyone. And if there is someone in your life who is particularly antagonistic, it's okay to just leave them and focus on maybe um, a parent or a friend who is more open-minded. You know, low-hanging fruit. Let's, let's focus on the people who are open-minded and want to listen first. I think that's important. Another thing to bear in mind, I suppose, is is trying to um, understand what their arguments are. So are they coming at it from a health perspective? Are they worried that you won't get enough protein or, or iron? Are they thinking about climate change? And, and are they worried that you know growing crops is actually less sustainable than, than, than grazing animals? Do they think that you know, what happens to animals in a farm is, is, isn't, isn't what we say it is? W what is the argument that they're using? And can you have a good response to that? I think being prepared and being informed is a really important thing for us. So just taking a little bit of time to educate ourselves on anything that we don't necessarily know, or if there is a specific concern we know the person has, can we just educate ourselves so that we're confident in our response? And I think that when we do engage with people, especially on a really emotive subject that's about morals and, and identity and all of these things, one of the things that I think is really important is not trying to tell someone how we feel necessarily, but trying to encourage them to discuss how they feel. And so what I mean by that is people don't like being told what they should or shouldn't do. You know, if, if someone comes up to you and says, you should do this, you should do that, that can be quite aggravating for us. What we like though, is being inspired to think about things for ourselves, because then we can come to conclusions on our own. And then we know that if we're making a change, we're doing it because it's something that we actually believe in. So what I like to do is I like to ask people lots of questions. So, for example, someone might say, I don't want to be vegan. Ask them why, first and foremost, why? Get their reason out there. They might say something like, um, well, I, you know, I just don't think you can get enough protein on a plant-based diet. And you might say, well, why do you think that? You know, I'm asking them, I'm not telling them that they're wrong. I'm just asking them why they think that so we can get deeper and deeper into their logic. And they might say, well, you know, meat's a good source of protein. And so we, we know if we don't eat meat, where do we get protein from? And then you could say, but do you think we can get protein from plants? 
And they might say yes, they might say no. And you can just keep going deeper and deeper. You know, you might ask them a question, something like, are you against animal cruelty? A really broad question. And then we'll probably say yes. And you might then say, can you define what being cruel to an animal means to you? So now you're getting them to define cruelty. And so once they've defined it, they may say something like, well, you know, it's causing needless harm or it's being unnecessarily violent to an animal. It's doing, you know, it's something like that. And you might say then something like, can you give me an example? You know, if I had a dog in front of me and I kicked that dog, would you classify that as animal cruelty? They're probably going to say yes. And then maybe you can say beyond that, you can say, if you believe that to be true, if kicking a dog is cruel, how could cutting someone, how could cutting an animal's throat not be cruel? How could mutilating an animal not be cruel? I think it's about trying to understand what their beliefs are and then trying to show them that their beliefs are actually contradicting themselves or their actions are contradicting their beliefs and that veganism actually does align with the values they have because we're all against dogs being kicked or cats being thrown around we, we all think that's wrong and, and rightfully so but if kicking an animal is wrong how can all the things that we do in farms and slaughterhouses not be wrong because a pig or a dairy cow or an egg laying hen these animals would wish that being kicked was the worst they had to suffer but because what they suffer is often far, far more severe. So asking lots of questions, being respectful, listening, trying not to interrupt, letting people explain themselves and validating people. If someone does say something like, but we need meat, we need to eat meat because it's got protein. You could say, I understand why you feel that way. It's of course true that meat is a good source of protein. And so I completely understand that you would believe that, that you would believe this to be true but do you think that you can get protein from plants, right? And that validation is really important because it makes someone feel more comfortable, more reassured. It shows them that you're listening. It shows them that you're compassionate, that you're not judgmental, that you're not gonna jump on them and call them you know, stupid and illogical and a bad person. It's kind of signaling that you are being compassionate to them, which we should be. So I think validation, asking questions, listening, being empathetic, but then also being educated so that we have responses that that we can give to people. All of those things combined can make conversations a little easier. But like I said at the start, if there is someone who is just not going to listen, it's okay not to engage with them and focus on people who will listen. Great. And I would like to just do one more, if that's all right, if we can keep you a yes. few minutes longer. So yes. there's a question here from Nisha Ivy from the the Jane Vegan Initiative. Um, yeah. I can give a little link in the chat for those who are unfamiliar with the Jane Vegan Initiative. Um, and they've asked that, well, they say, I'd love to know Ed's thoughts on products that seem to be vegan, but are not considered so because they were tested on animals during research and mm -hmm. development. For example, Just Egg, a plant-based egg replacement. Um, so I think that's a great question. And if you want to connect that also to what we might call these, I don't want to call them fringe necessarily, but these kind of other issues that are not the main issues and how mm -hmm. you really feel about engaging with them. It's a very, it's a good question. It's a complex question. And I think the first thing to understand is that the problem is there are certain legal requirements and loopholes that um, certain companies will have to jump through to get things signed off as being safe or as, or as acceptable. And so I think the first thing to recognize that it's not, it's not necessarily the fault of the company if the legal system where they exist forces them to engage in something that they wouldn't normally want to engage in. I think that's the first thing to recognize. The second, thing, the second thing to recognize is that a lot of the things that we don't think of in this way were previously tested on animals. You know, even when we buy cruelty-free things now, which I think, you know, buying from cruelty-free brands is the thing to do. But some of those products in those cruelty-free, you know, uh, toiletries that we might use have been at some point tested on animals. It's that they were deemed safe and now they're no longer tested. And so these companies can use them and be cruelty-free because as a company, they're not engaged in the testing. But at some points in the ingredients they're using, were tested. And so it also depends on those that degree of separation. How long since they were tested on animals does it become okay for those ingredients to be used in, in cruelty-free or vegan products? I'm not 100% sure. I guess that's that's a, a decision that you'd have to make on your own. Is it that it has to be 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, or is it okay for these products to be used, these ingredients to be used by companies that want to do something positive because the companies themselves have no choice in, in the matter? And I think it depends how you approach this issue, because one could argue that the, the, the just egg as a product would 
because it exists is causing a positive outcome is getting people to eat less eggs and is therefore contributing to less suffering because it's existing and so therefore the fact that this happened whilst it is immoral that it happened and is awful that it happened then it's awful these companies are forced to do this is it necessarily the fault of the company and should that stop us from promoting just egg or indeed even consuming just egg if doing so is actually helping more than hindering now that it exists and is as commercially viable and safe and available so I think it's a complex one, but I don't, I think that it's important that we don't sometimes overlook the, the complexities that a company like Just Egg has faced and then the positive outcome that has come as a consequence of them existing. And I don't think that it's necessarily not vegan. I don't think that it's, it's not vegan to consume these foods because of this, this legal requirement. That being said, any vegan and anyone who cares about animals should hope that we will soon be in a world where these things don't happen, where animal testing becomes obsolete, where, where it's not something that's legally required for new products because the technology and the scientific mentality behind it doesn't make sense. Um, we can see that through nutrition studies. We, we test uh, ingredients on on rats to find out if they're toxic and then we we do the same tests on humans or we, we we give these products to humans and they may have been toxic in rats but perfectly fine in humans or vice versa and so look this is a scientifically dubious practice even you know to those who who might consider it an ethically justified practice but you know that point aside i think we would all like to see well why these things aren't happen to animals because some of the the vivisection side of things is truly horrifying. Um, the things that we do to animals for testing um, is like it's just some of the most unspeakably awful things that anyone could do to anyone else. So yeah, I, I really hope that we get to a point in time where these things are, are viewed as the, these awful, awful things that we used to do rather than things that we currently do. But just to make it more about back to the question itself, um, I think it's regrettable and, and unfortunate that these things are happening and that are forced on companies like just eat for, or just eggs for example um but ultimately i don't think that we should hold it against them but hold it against the system that puts them in this situation if that makes sense yeah thank you for for that and i think that's an important reminder and I think the chain tradition speaks of this as well is that so many of our undertakings involve violence like we're not going to escape it completely it's not an ethic of perfection, ahimsa, and, and veganism, um, and yet we can be vigilant at the same time, um, and that takes compassion and it takes diligence, all the things that you've spoken of today. Um, so I'm sorry, I want to give my apologies to others who had questions. Uh, we're running a little over already, but I, you know, I hope that you've been able to have some of your questions answered, even if um, not directly. And I would like to thank Ed for giving his time today um, and speaking to this very controversial, sensitive, but urgent issue. I'd also like to thank all of you for coming to this event in the Voices in Vegan Studies speaker series. And I truly hope that you make it to our event in two weeks and then our events that follow every month thereafter. So with that, I'd like to say thank you all. Thank you, Ed. and. We will see you next time. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Jonathan, for inviting me. But thank you, everyone, for, for, for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. And um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the series, which is brilliant. Thank you so much for organizing the series. It's, it's, it's a terrific series. Yeah, it's exciting. Thanks so much. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye.